Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Dennis Fries, and I am a lifelong student of George Orwell and his works. And today I'm going to talk to you about the truth and Mr. Blair, which is the conflict that went on inside Eric Blair's mind uh, all through his life and how it was settled. Right, okay, let's begin. The truth and Mr. Blair, being the life and times of George Orwell, with particular regard to his struggle with telling the truth. Part one, Eric, or Pucker, but poor. In the 1980s, I worked in the outskirts, a school in the outskirts of Buenos Aires. In those days, I affected the smoking of cheroots. So maybe twice a week, I had to make my way along a street lined with lime trees until I reached the tobacconists in the centre of the town, where stood graffiti covered public monuments. It had been the custom in Buenos Aires to paint a white band round the trees and lop the branches in spring, but this was more honoured in the breach than the observance, and I made a comment to that effect to the tobacconist. Ah, oh, senor, he sighed, I look at all this graffiti. Now in the old days, under the military, none of this would have happened. All the trees were tidy with their white bands. All the monuments were clean. What we need is the military government back. Suddenly, a small quotation crackled across my brain. All tobacconists are fascists. And with them came a whole quiz competition of aphorisms. By the age of 50, everyone has the face he deserves. International sport is merely war minus the shooting. Who controls the past controls the future. An intelligent man can convince himself of anything. Freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two equals four. All of these are aphorisms. An aphorism convinces us of its truth by very quickly getting to a truth, but not necessarily the whole truth by verbal brilliance. They tell us a lot about the aphorist who may seek to convince you of the total truth of what he is saying by the pithy way in which he says it. It comes as no surprise, therefore, to learn that all the above aphorisms were coined by Eric Arthur Blair, or to use his pseudonym, George Orwell. And are not pseudonyms sometimes symptomatic of an inner struggle within the author's self to establish the truth about who he or she really is? Like a Venetian carnival mask, the pseudonym is an inherently untruthful, deceitful tool. It both hides who the person is and gives that person the chance to escape to the person he'd rather be. And George Orwell felt he needed one, certainly in the 1930s. And this introduces our task to track the life of George, aka Eric, and start and chart the course of his varying relationship with the coup, with the truth. Eric Arthur Blair was born on 23rd June 1903 at Motahari near the Bengali border in what was then British India. From the very beginning his roots were ambivalent. His father was one of the small pillars upon whom the mighty Raj rested. He was a civil servant, fourth grade in the opium department. He never rose to more than fifth grade. Nowadays, we would assume opium department to mean drug enforcement agency, but in a completely Orwellian way, the name of the government department was precisely the opposite of what its title proclaimed. British India's Opium Department was concerned 
with the sale and quality take control of opium to be smoked by coolies in dens in China. The Blairs were absolutely true blue British establishment stock, but with one quirk. Most families strive to be upwardly mobile. The Blairs contrived to be downwardly mobile. Baby Eric's grandfather had been married to a daughter of the Earl of Westmoreland. The son of that union became a vicar, was for many years an army chaplain in India, and retired as a dean in Dorset. Richard Walmsley Blair, Eric's father, was therefore a clergyman's son, a fourth grade clerk in the Indian Opium Department. Could his son contrive to go down any further? Well, as all of you know, a good sight further, from a shiny booted imperial policeman to a tramp in Kent and a dishwasher in Paris. If baby Eric's father was absolutely conventional, the woman he married definitely versed on the exotic. Ida Mabel Blair's maiden name was Limousin. Although born in Surrey of an English mother, the main family connection was French. The Limousin family were in the teak trade. And where do you get teak? In Burma. All the time Eric was in Burma, his uncle was in Rangoon, managing the family firm. All the time he claimed he was living in abject poverty in Paris, his aunt was only a few quarters away. Said aunt was exotic. She had moved to Paris to be with her Esperantist lover. Ida's sisters, Ida's sisters were rich enough to dabble in, in socialism and Fabianism, and Eric's mother, Ida herself, appeared to be a sort of anti-man feminist of her day. She took the children away from India when Eric was three, and he never saw his father for another six years. This is common enough in Raj families, but, but Ida Blair seemed to take it one step further. Men were brutes who forced themselves on women. Certainly she would have none of this. And when Eric's father came back finally, after 38 years service in India, she immediately banished him to a separate bedroom. No wonder he volunteered at age 60 for the First World War. With this genus-like parentage, the progressive exotic mother, the staid empire loyalist Henley Golf Club father, what better hothouse could there be to produce a Tory anarchist? Certainly this title given to the first great satirist to use animals, Dean Swift, could equally be applied to an Orwell. And through this dialectic, the Eton scholar who shirked learning, the imperial policeman who despised the chota peg drinkers in the British club, the middle class boy brought up to despise the smelling working class, but who bums his way around doll's houses. Through that continual genus like struggle to express one view of the truth, we eventually arrive at someone which both sides of him can enthusiastically embrace the whole truth. The truth about Stalinism, the truth about dictatorship of any description, political or religious. Eric's first encounter with dictatorship, at least that's how his biographer Eric Bowker sees it, came when the first unfortunate teachers were given the task of educating the infant Prometheus. All Blair sisters were sent to be educated by the Ursuline sisters in France. According to Bowker, Eric's early learning was entrusted to a group of nuns who ran a school in Henley and Thames. Bowker adduces Blair's undoubted lifelong detestation of the Catholic Church to the certainties hammered in to the children by the good sisters. In those days, the Catholic Catechism contained the long 
act of faith. And the phrase, and I furthermore believe anything the Catholic Church proposes to be believed, as it is the sovereign truth, which can neither deceive nor be deceived. Now, let's cut to room 101. The Inquisitor, O'Brien, described as having the air of a priest, speaks to Winston. You are here because you have failed in humility. You would not make the act of submission. Whatever the party holds to be the truth is the truth. Orwell's next encounter with truth came through the medium school. Last year, I was driving up the A9 beyond Perth with my wife. As we passed through the Grousemoor country, fishing rivers and shooting estates, I turned to my wife and I said, this area turned George Orwell into a socialist. How so? Well, at the age of eight, Eric was sent to St. Cyprian's, a preparatory school now demolished in Eastbourne. Eric's parents were puck up but poor. And, at, and Eric was accepted on an arrangement whereby his brains would pay for his education. St. Cyprian's prided itself on cramming a certain number of boys every year into the greatest public schools, certainly Eton, and Eric was one of the geese chosen to be fattened for entrance examinations. On the one hand, there were the rich boys who seemed to drip money from their pores. The snobbish chatter about Switzerland and Scotland with its gillies and grouse moors and my uncle's yacht and my pony and my pater's touring car. On the other hand, there was the hapless Eric being flogged up the street like a derby house to the winning post of common entrance. Here he is in trouble with the headmaster Sambo and his redoubtable wife Flip who is speaking. I don't think it's awfully decent of you to behave like this, is it? Do you think it's quite playing the game by your mother and father to go on idling your time away? Week after week, month after month. Do you, do you want to throw away all your chances? You know your people aren't rich, don't you? You know they can't afford the same things as other boys' parents. How are they to send you to a public school if you don't win a scholarship? I know how proud your mother is of you. Do you want to let her down? I don't think he wants to go to a public school any longer, Samba would say, addressing himself to Flip with a pretense I was not there. I think he has given up that idea. He wants to be a little office boy at £40 a year. Sambo, who did not aspire to be loved by his pupils, Put it more brutally, though this was usually, uh, as usual with him in pompous language. You are living on my bounty, was his favourite phrase in this context. At least once I listened to those words between blows of the cane. The above co quotes are from Such, Such Were the Joys. George Orwell's account, written in 1947, of his prep school days. No depth of Dickensian detail is not plumbed in the superior do the boys hall. There were beatings by the headmaster Sambo, an educational martinet who, when one cane broke during a flogging, simply fetched a new one. I quote, there were pewter bowls out of which we had our porridge. They had overhanging rims, and under the rims were accumulations of sour porridge, which could be flaked off in long strips. The porridge itself, too, contained more lumps, hairs, and unexplained black things than one would have thought possible, unless someone were putting them in there on purpose. There was the cult of Scotland which made Orwell detest the Scots gentry as much as he did the Catholic religion. The school, this is from such, such were the joys, the school was pervaded by a curious cult of Scotland, which brought out the fundamental contradictions in our standard of values. 
Flip claimed Scottish ancestry, and she favoured the Scottish boys, encouraging them to wear kilts in their ancestral tartan instead of the school uniform, and even christened her youngest child by a Gallic name. Ostensibly, we were supposed to admire the Scots because they were grim and dour. Stern was perhaps the key word and irresistible on the field of battle. In the big schoolroom, there was a steel engraving of the charge of the Scots Greys at Waterloo, all looking as though they enjoyed every moment of it. Our picture of Scotland was made up of burns, braes, kilts, sporans, claymores, bagpipes, and the like, all somehow mixed up with the invigorating effects of porridge, Protestantism and a cold climate. But underlying this was something quite different. Scotland was a private paradise, which a few initiates could talk about and make outsiders feel small. You go to Scotland as halls? Brother, we go out of here. My pater's got three miles of river. My pater's giving me a new gun for the twelfth. There's a jolly good black game up there. When we go, get out, Smith. What are you listening for? You've never been to Scotland. I bet you don't know what a black cock looks like. Following on this, imitations of the cry of the black cock, the roaring of the stag, or the accent of our gillies, etc., etc. But let's keep our eye on stated title. Was any of the above true? Are there any witnesses? Well, one was Gavin Maxwell who described their life there 10 years after Blair had left as a prison sentence that ending in a, ended in escape, however ignominious. On the other hand, there was Henry Longhurst, the golfer. I conclude that St. Cyprian's was a very good school indeed, and he wondered whether its detractors were writing of, of the same institution. And on both sides of the fence, there was a celebrated Cyril Connolly. We no doubt all remember Cyril Connolly, the dean of literary journalism, the arbiter of taste, the mirror and the glass of literary fashion. In his earlier life, Connolly bitterly attacked the school where he was blue with coal, haunting the radiators and the lavatories and waking up every morning with the accumulated misery of the morning before. Yet the mature Connolly took severe remorse of conscience and actually attended the funeral of Mrs. Wilkes, the maligned wife of the headmaster Sambo, although he later said it was only to make sure she was dead. Andrew Gow, Blair's tutor at Eton, wrote, I know the Wilkeses and the school quite well, and the essay is monstrously unfair. So, what was, what was he, George Orwell, developing into? His reportage raises questions about his veracity, too, that whether he was telling the objective truth or simply selective with the facts, he emerged as a superb writer of polemic, a word that would feature in his later life. Once Orwell got his knife into you, he certainly knew how to twist it to draw blood. Eric Arthur Blair did justify the methods used by the Wellesies. He won a scholarship to Eton College. Here again, he was different from the majority of the boys. Blair was a king scholar, a group of 70 boys who fulfilled the original purpose of the school. Uh, these boys are therefore called foundationers. Um, as as opposed to oppidans or town dwellers, or originally who are there because of their money or social eminence. Can you see the same dichotomy confirming itself in the teenage Orwell? He had to earn his keep at Eton by the sweat of his brain, while others could lord it over him. Suffice it to say, he never fulfilled his promise, even in a system so replete with old boy con tax as the Oxbridge entry system, he failed to gain entrance to either Oxford or Cambridge. His tutor, Andrew Gow, couldn't find it in himself to write the necessary recommendations. He became a rebel, one incident over his being confirmed in the Anglican Church. 
Notably, he had a teacher for a short time, Aldous Huxley, the author of Brave New World, a dystopia, which, like Russian Zamyatins, we must have been one of the tributaries to the rivers of Animal Farm in 1984. So far, we have seen Orwell as a guy who didn't fit in, either at prep school or at Eton. But now he really surpassed himself in self-flagellatory exotica. He joined the Imperial Burner Police. Now, it is true that the colonies had as one of their main purposes the provision of homes and jobs for the failures, misfits and independent thinkers born within Great Britain. What hopes did Orwell entertain as he left England, rejected by his first love, Jacintha Buddicum? This is the Tory part of the Tory anarchists coming to the fore. The Empire loyalist who set about Burma's, Burma school students with his rattan, the policeman's cane, on a railway platform for their irreverent jibes and grims. The man who fantasised over bayoneting rebellious student monks. But if so, it didn't last. According to Roger Beedon, a fellow rookie, Blair never fitted in right from the basic training at Corso Fort de Ferrum. I quote from Gordon Bowker, he brought his eaten aloofness with him. Old ghosts of being puck about poor resurface. The Gymkhana Club, to which he had the right to belong, was brilliantly equipped but extensive. He began to withdraw within himself reading D.H. Lawrence in his room. Eric may well have met that other scourge of the colonial classes, Somerset Maugham, and his contemporary in his travels through Burma. Depression shot in, set in. He wrote to Jacintha Buddicum, saying he'd made a huge mistake, and she advised him to quit, but he couldn't, yet face failure in the eyes of his family. He came to hate his job the daily particularities of marching behind his men, the steam of these hundred sweating bodies in front of me made my stomach turn. All I knew was that it was lower class sweat that I was smelling, and the thought of it made me sick. Becomes, of course, intellectualised in Blair into a generalised hatred of the Raj as a racket, and produced such well-known subversive writings as shooting an elephant and a hanging. Blair himself wrote, with one part of my mind, I thought of the British Raj as an unbreakable tyranny, as something clumped down in sacral seculorum upon the will of prostrate people. With another part, I thought the greatest joy in the world would be to drive a bayonet into a Buddhist priest's guts. Tory anarchist, dichotomized personally, personality, who was a true Mr. Blair? Whatever the answer, Eric Arthur Blair could not live with the kind dichotomy. After five years in Burma, he was to a home furlough, and during that furlough, he wrote his resignation from the Imperial Burma Police. So, we can use three metaphors regarding Orwell's road to Mandalay. One, the road proved a dead end as far as career was concerned. Two, it proved the way ahead. Blair, Blair perversely stuck to his view of the truth about the Raj, despite the fury of received opinion around him. The chief of police called him a damn disgrace to Eton College. But sticking grimly to one's guns, in spite of the powerful and influential, sticking to the truth, no matter how much it might cost him in terms of financial career security, is, is a trend we shall have to watch in Mr Blair. And third, to release you from this wretched road metaphor, the road to Mandalay proved also to be a U-turn. Eric Blair was now back in England and would therefore commit his future to being one of those who shaped the soul of English socialism, or an inksock, inksock, as we might call it. One moment. Part two, the road to Barcelona. The England he was an <coughs> return to was not the one he had left. Like plancing showground horses, pivoting round the central drum of the recession, the bright young intellectuals who might in the twenties have exposed homosexuality or Catholicism now exposed both homosexuality and communism. Waiting in the wings to capitalise on the mood of the country, 
the notion that to be any sort of intellectual, you had to be a left wing. It's a man called Victor Golansh. Golansh's list of publications included a monthly book club called the Left Book Club, which in the days before the TV documentary purveyed a view of Britain through red tinted spectacles. One of Golansh's readers picked up the manuscript by a young writer called George Orwell. Significantly for our quest for the truth in Mr. Blair, the reader, Gerald Gould, found the manuscript embroidered a little here and there, but substantially true. The book had various titles, A, Scull a Scullion's Diary, Days in Paris and London, etc. But finally, Golan's prevailed upon the author to hit the bookshops with the title Down and Out and Paris and London. So who was this new author and what were his credentials to write? Well, it was the same Eric Blair we left on his return from Burma. The same outsider we first met at St Cyprian's. The same underachiever at Eton. The same roar against any current he happened to find himself in. This time it was the middle class respectability of his parents, which he was determined to let down. The trim, shiny booted officer we see in the Rangoon photos had become a stubbly down and out, down and out, in a slouch hat which shaded his eyes, a hirsute antique tweed jacket and positively insanitary flannels. He was diving down a bottomless well and first made his way to Paris, where he deliberately saw its self-degradation, living in the filthiest flea pits, consorting with prostitutes, attending a hospital which was more like a torture chamber and working in filth and squalor as a plongeur, a dishwasher, in, in reputedly the Hotel Georges Slank. Yet the description of his life as a tramp didn't fool people who really knew him. Of his English adventures, his girlfriend, Brenda Salker, Sol told him he was a fraud. He knew he could always come home, so he could never experience what a real tramp feels like. Similarly in Paris, Suzanne lived in a not too far distant arrondissement, where she was a partner of the leading French Esperantist. It's actually the Esperantist who was the more important figure. He was a lapsed communist. He had actually seen the future and knew it didn't work. And here we hear the opening notes of an overture. The difference between appearance and reality. A revolution betrayed. The difference between lies and truth but we're now looking too far into the future. George Orwell now proceeded to oil the predilections of his left-wing readers with a grand guignol of fantasy, which out Dickens Dickens. In fact, it was all too bad to be true. Many years ago, I used Down and Out for the non-fiction writing section of Higher English, Scotland's pre-university leaving certificate. But the more you examined it as a documentary, the more fictional it became. Take, for example, the part where he teams up with an Irish tramp in Kent. They're looking in a bookshop window when suddenly the Irishman explodes with rage and calls for the bookshop to be closed down for blasphemous obscenity. When Horwell inquires why, he is told to look at that book there. Sure, what do they want to go imitate them for? The object of the Irishman's wrath is a copy of The Imitation of Christ. This is such a trite Irishman story that one is almost attempted to preface it with the words, there was this Kerry man. Back in Paris, we are definitely in a world of O. Henry stories. So neatly constructed, such perfect denouement. Let me take the story of the starving couple. The man finds that if the woman goes to a hospital and says she is pregnant, she gets a meal. She goes to the hospital every day and gets a meal. A year later, they are walking near the same hospital and they meet the nurse who was in charge of the maternity hospital. Mon Dieu, Yvonne cried, I am ruined. I hope you are well, ma petite, the nurse said kindly. And your baby, is he well too? Was it a boy, as you were hoping? Yvonne had begun trembling so hard, I had to grip her arm. No, she said at last. Ah, then, évidemment, it was a girl. Thereupon, Yvonne, the idiot, lost her head completely. No, she actually said again. 
The nurse was taken aback. Come on, she explained. Neither a boy nor a girl. But how can that be? Figure to yourself, figurez-vous, messieurs et mesdames. It was a dangerous movement. Yvonne had turned the colour of a beetroot and looked ready to burst into tears. Another second and she would have confessed everything. Heaven knows what might have happened. But as for me, I had kept my head. I stepped in and saved the situation. It was twins, I said calmly. Twins, exclaimed the nurse. And she was so pleased that she took Yvonne by the shoulders and embraced her in both cheeks publicly. Yes, twins. Or let's read just the beginning of Charlie and the Prostitute. He is talking about his favourite subject. Ah, l'amour, l'amour. Que les femmes m'ont tué. Alas, messieurs et mesdames, women have been my ruin. Beyond all hope, my ruin. At 22, I'm utterly worn out and finished. But what things have I learned? What abysses of wisdom have I not plumbed? How great a thing it is to have acquired the, the true wisdom to have become the highest sense of the world. A civilized man to have become raffiné, vicieux. Monsieur et dame, I perceive you are sad. Mais la vie est belle. You must not be sad. Be more gay, I beseech you. All it needs is Maurice Chevalier. So the rebel with several causes seen by the mid-1930s to have found his true niche. He can exercise the rebellious side of his nature and earn a comfortable living by being Eric, the famous author, as before the First World War, he promised truth in the body come he would be. He doesn't need to be always strictly truthful about it, as he shocks the progressive bourgeoisie with scabrous tales of the underground world which was just below their level of vision. And so it was he went to write Road to Wigan Pier, a reportage on life among the working class up north. At first we see the by now predictable or weary and fear. Let's go into the living room of the Brooker's tripe shop and lodging house where Orwell chooses to put up. In front of the fire there was almost always a line of damp washing and the middle of the room was a big kitchen table at which the family and all the lodgers ate. I never saw this table completely uncovered, but I saw it in its various wrappings at different times. At the bottom was a layer of old newspapers stained by Worcester sauce. Above that, a sheet of sticky white oil cloth. Above that, a green serge cloth. Above that, a coarse linen cloth, never changed and seldom taken off. Generally, the crumbs from breakfast were still on the table at supper. I used to get used. I used to get to know individual crumbs by sight and watch their progress up and down the table from day to day. This is the Hotel Zor sank in Paris revisited. Orwell chooses to present such squalor as typical of the working class, a gross distortion of the truth. He is, he is depicting the underclass, not the respectable working class. And here I'm going to make a personal statement, short personal statement. I was brought up in the industrial West of Scotland's working class. I knew nobody who lived in conditions like that. Respectability was the byword, reflected in red ochre front steps and spotless washing lines. The boy next door to me became an archbishop in the Episcopal Church. My mother never drank alcohol and my father seldom. And it was over such a distorted view that Eric Blair had his first run in with the leadership of the Communist Party. In the Daily Worker of 17th March 1937, Harry Pollitt, General Secretary of the British Communist Party, dismissed our all as a disillusioned little middle class boy and late imperial policeman. Mind you, this may have had something to do with the fact that Orwell had already been interviewed by Pollitt with a view of going to Spain. To Pollock's question if he was going to join the International Brigade, Orwell suddenly blurted out the straight truth. I'll see when I get there. Pollock then refused to help him, categorising him as politically unreliable. But this flash of honesty in front of a figure such as Pollock, as powerful in his own way as any blimp colonel in Burner or Eaton Toff, showed the course Blair's mind and character was now taking. 
but in winning in Pier, he delivers one of the most honest pieces of reportage ever in his description of the work of the coal miner. At the start, to walk stooping is rather a joke, but it's a joke that soon wears off. I am handicapped by being exceptionally tall, but when the roof falls to four feet or less, it is a tough job for anybody except a dwarf or a child. You've not only got to bend double, you have to also keep your head up all the while so as to see the beams and girders and dodge them when they come. You have therefore a constant crick in the neck, but this is nothing to the pain in your knees and thighs. After half a mile it becomes, I'm not exaggerating, an unbearable agony. You begin to wonder whether you will ever get to the end. Still more how on earth you will ever get back. For a couple of hundred yards, it's all exceptional low. But after that, there is another stretch of a hundred yards and then a succession of beams, which you have to crawl under. When you come to the end of the beams and try to get up again, you find that your knees have temporarily struck work and refuse to lift you. But then comes the conclusion that Orwell reaches from the scene. How about this? For having a go at every orthodoxy then existing in Britain. It raises in you a momentary doubt about your own status as an intellectual and superior person generally. For it is brought home to you that it is only because the miners sweat their guts out that superior persons can remain superior. You and I and the editor of the Times Literary Supplement and the Nancy Poets and the Archbishop of Canterbury and Comrade X, author of Marxism, for instance, all of us really owe the comparative decency of our lives to poor dredges underground, blackened to the eyes, with our throats full of coal dust, driving their shovels forward with arms and bellies, muscles of steel. Could a man with such opinion and such a voice long remain the literary lapdog of the comfortably off left wing? On the 18th of July, 1936, a civil war broke out in Spain. Suffice it to say, within a month, Spain had split into two camps, nationalists and republicans. The democracy stayed neutral, indeed Britain was almost tacitly on Franco's side. Here, Uncle Joe Stalin saw his opportunity. If he supplied the weapons, he could build the Communist Party into a power way beyond its actual strength in the affections of the people. The price of Stalin's aid was handing over the Bank of Spain's gold reserves. These were used to finance the Moscow Metro with a lot of the refugees from the International Brigade of Slave Labour. So the Republican government became effectively the dog being wagged by the communist tail. Into this situation came our hero, and given his propensity to go against the grain, to reject the received establishment, with whom do you think he threw in his lot in Spain? Not the government, or the might of the Communist International Brigade, not even the anarchists, which you might have expected. Instead, he threw in his lot with the poem, the Partido Obrero Unificado Marxista. This is not of Orwell's choosing, it must be said. He was sent out to Spain as a correspondent under the auspices of the seekers of the Holy Grail of Socialism, the Independent Labour Party. After training at Lenin Barracks in Barcelona, Orwell was sent to the Huesca Front, where he joined the 26th POA Poem Battalion of the Popular Front army. And then, one spring morning, he put his head above the parapet and was shot clean through the neck. You think a bullet through the neck would be fairly final, especially centimetres to the left of the carotid artery. Had that been punctured, nothing could have saved him. But what happened was truly strange. As you may know, a bullet spins in flight, and as the bullet spun through Orwell's neck, it cauterised the wound leaving it infection free. I find it one of the great ironies of literary history that a bullet from the army of the great anti-communist crusader Franco would nearly prove fatal to a far more successful anti-communist, George Orwell. Orwell was then evacuated, first to a hospital near Saragossa and then back to Barcelona. 
there to receive a hero, a hero's welcome? Not a bit of it. Let Orwell tell the story of himself and what's a pivotal piece of writing. Homage to Catalonia. That afternoon, between three and four, I was halfway down the Ramblers when I heard several rifle shots behind me. I turned round and saw some youths with rifles in their hands and the red and black handkerchiefs of the anarchists round their throats, edging up a side street that ran off the Ramblers northwards. They were evidently exchanging shots with someone in a tall tavern of power that commanded the side street. I thought instantly it started, but I thought it without any great feeling of surprise. For days past, everyone had been expecting it to start. The fighting went on for days, with Orwell lying on the roof of the telephone exchange, ready to open fire on members of the Guardia Civile on the roof of the cinema opposite. The cause of the civil war within a civil war was the decision of the Alliancia government to disarm all groups. To enforce this, they would use the guerrilla and the communist controlled PSUC militia. Obviously, to the anarchists in the poem, this looked like a coming genocide and fighting broke out all over Barcelona between one side and the other. The matter was finally settled by 6,000 assault guards arriving from Valencia and restoring order. But what is absolutely seminal to Orwell's work was the aftermath. In the, in the communist and pro-communist press, the entire blame for the Barcelona fighting was laid upon the poor. The affair was represented not a spontaneous up outbreak, but as a deliberate, planned insurrection against the, the government, engineered solely by the poem with the aid of a few misguided uncontrollables. More than this, it was definitely a fascist plot carried out under fascist orders with the idea of starting a civil war in the rear and thus paralyzing the government. The poem was Franco's fifth column, a Trotskyist organization working in league with the fascists. According to the Daily Worker on the 11th of May, in other words, what was being prepared was a situation in which the Germans and Italian governments could land troops and marines quite openly on the Catalan coast, declaring they were doing so in order to preserve order. The instrument for all this lay ready to hand for the Germans and Italians in the shape of the Trotskyist organization known as the poem. The poem, in acting in cooperation with well-known criminal elements and with certain other deluded persons in the anarchist organizations, planned, organized, and led the attack in the rear guard, accurately timed to coincide with the attack on the front of Bilbao, etc., etc. The last sentence was like Bruce Titch paper and retire immediately, as far as Orwell's subsequent life and career were concerned. I could quote a great deal more, but this is clear enough. The poem were wholly responsible and the poem were acting under fascist orders. If you want corroboration of this, the best author in the Spanish Civil War is Anthony Beaver. Here he is describing what was going on at the upper levels of the Spanish Republican government. On 9th of May, after the ceasefire in Barcelona, Jose Diaz of the party's central committee advanced a strategy of, a, of dealing ruthlessly with the poem. The fifth column has been unmasked, he declared. We need to destroy it. Some call themselves Trotskyists, which is named by many disguised fascists who use revolutionary language in order to sow confusion. I therefore ask, if everyone knows this, if the government knows it, why does it not treat them like fascists and exterminate them pitilessly? Now, in the next sentence, when I say Trotsky, you think Goldstein. It was Trotsky himself who directed the gang of criminals that derailed trains in the Soviet Union, carried out acts of sabotage in the large factories, and did everything possible to discover military secrets, and with the object of handing them over to Hitler and the Japanese imperialists. At a cabinet meeting on 15th May, the communist minister Uribe demanded on Moscow's orders that the poem be suppressed and its leaders arrested. In the rest of Homage to Catalonia, Orwell launches into a fierce and detailed attack on the lives of the communist press, asking, for example, if they believed an ILP stalwart such as Jimmy Maxton was objectively a fascist. 
the diligent, work sharp, time serving hack writer of uncertain odyssey had found his cause at last. The truth. Not the road to Wigan Pier, but the road to Barcelona was his road to Damascus. The events in Barcelona had profound effects on Orwell with immediate and long term. A general roundup of poor members was progress, progress and generalised charges of Trotskyism and assisting the fascists by creating a revolt in the Republican rear. The poem was regarded as a sister party by the ILP, who were Orwell's sponsors. After sleeping rough at night in bombed out churches, Orwell, his wife Eileen and other ILPers managed to wake their way across the French border, not a day too late. But professionally worse was to follow. On his return to London, he was summoned to the head office of Victor Collins and told by a deputy that they would not want to publish anything whatever he produced. All was gone now. The comfortable living peddling left-wing social tourism to the progressive middle class. The childhood goal of Eric, the famous writer. Everything had been snuffed out. And Orwell had no doubt that Golan's connection with the Communist Party headquarters in King Street were the reason. So I said, pause a minute. Indeed, I'll have a small drink for a minute. How would any of us have reacted in those circumstances? The hammer blows Harwell had received, both physical and metaphysical, since he had veered from Gaulish's ideas of orthodoxy, might have been enough to make a day's Orwell seek forever an obscure life as a village grocer. But no, a bit of it, the sun was about to rise for Eric Arthur Blair and make him one of the most influential writers of the 20th century. Part three, said jesting Pilot. Keeping his ear to the ground was the owner of a publishing house which had had little success. This man was called Frederick Warburg. He had contacts within the ILP. He knew of Orwell's sacking by Golans. So the day after the sacking, Warburg wrote to Orwell asking how if he would like to write about his Spanish experiences for him. Now, all the traits we have traced in Orwell came together in one volcanic outburst. His hatred of the new communist orthodoxy was just as strong as for the orthodoxies of the Burma police, Eton College and St. Cyprian's School. The anarchists could throw off the shackles of writing left-wing propaganda and write absolutely fearlessly, as he says in one of his essays, about what he had observed, a revolution betrayed. He had nothing to lose by kicking up Kant and hypocrisy and going for the truth. He wanted to call the book Spilling the Spanish Boons, but Warburg persuaded him to call it Homage to Catalonia. Needless to say, his expose of the communist role in subverting the cause of the Spanish Republic to further the ends of Stalin received absolute obloquy from both the usual direction of the Daily Worker and also its sympathisers on other organs, such as the dear old Harmless the Listener, which resurrected the claim that the poem was a past fascist fifth column. After representations by Orwell, the writer of that review was publicly rebuked by his editor. Perhaps because of the savaging by the literary establishment, perhaps because of the glut of books published about the Spanish War, homage to Catalonia did not sell spectacular like only 700 copies. But what it did was to establish Orwell's relationship with an alternative purposer who fell in with Orwell's general philosophy. During the coming Second World War, neither supported the government uncritically, nor opposed the war, nor swallowed the Russian myth, as he explained in Tribune of which he had become lit the socialist magazine, which he had become literary editor during the war. In the meantime, he connected his not inconsiderable polemical skills to give his communist opponents as much as they had dished out to him. Here he is in the essay, The Prevention of Literature, describing the back and forth antics of the committed communist writer in the period 1938 to 41. For years before September 1939, he was expected to be in a continuous stew about the horrors of Nazism and to twist every hero into a denunciation of Hitler. After September 1939, for 20 months, he had to believe Germany was more sinned against than sinning. 
immediately after hearing the 8 o'clock news bulletin in the morning of 22nd June 1941, he had to start believing once again that Nazism was the most hideous evil the world had ever seen. Political writing in our time consists almost entirely of prefabricated phrases, he wrote, bolted together like pieces of a child's mechanist's head. It is the unavoidable result of self censorship To write in plain, vigorous language, one has to think fearlessly. Clearly, we have here a protest day, not only for Squealer and Animal Farm, but also for Doublethink and Newspeak in 1984. In the early part of the war, Orwell earned his living in Broadcasting House. Somehow, some indeed see Broadcasting House's architecture as a prototype for the Ministry of Truth in 1984. Among those Orwell managed to rope in to his literature talks to keep India on our side were the world conflict by panel discussions on the ambiguity of the novels of Henry James that was one Thomas Stern's earlier. We will see shortly how Elliot played this. I don't want to go into all the possible routes that led to the flowering of Animal Farm, one of the two great political satires written in prose by an Englishman. You can go back to Aesop's Fables, you can go back to the Hohenems and Gulliver's Travellers, you can go, go back to the late 1930s and the Spanish War veteran and unemployed writer Eric Blair running a small holding with goats and other animals while running the village shop. You can even bring in Darwin. Suffice it to say, after all the batterings from Stalin's literary henchmen, Truth finally spoke back to power and delivered an almighty knockout blow. It is difficult to underestimate the power this book had in combating communism and the dictatorships of every kind. Animal Farm, I believe, was more effective in destroying Bolshevism than all Hitler's armies put together. Proof indeed that the pen is mightier than the sword. Orwell's marvellous dole's eye gift for satire rained repeated blows on the betrayal of the, the, the new of the revolution. I'm only going to take two examples to show how Orwell's genius worked. First, let's look at the, the flag of the new utopia, the flag of the new utopia. On Sundays, there was no work. Breakfast was an hour later than usual. And after breakfast, there was a ceremony which was observed every week without fail. First came the hoisting of the flag. Snowball had found in the harness room an old green tablecloth of Mr. Jones's uh, and had painted on a hoof and a horn in white. This was run up to the flagstaff in the farmhouse garden every Sunday morning. The flag was green, Snowball explained, to represent the green fields of England, while the hoof and horn signified the future republic of the animals, which would arise when the human race had been finally overthrown. Now, do you remember what I said right at the beginning? About, the, about Orwell being the master of aphorism. Animal Farm contains an aphorism, which like a lot of quotes from Shakespeare, has been passed ineradically into the English language. It epitomizes the mourning for a lost revolution, the two-facedness of all Stalin's apologies, and asking the question about whether it's possible to change society, let alone human beings, into something different from our ordinary human nature. All animals are equal. But some animals are more equal than others. Orwell thought he was going to get away with it without a fight. He was mistaken. Orwell let T.S. Eliot, remember the guy that Orwell got onto the talk show at the BBC? See the book. Eliot dismissed the book as an amusing little squib. The long arm of Uncle Joe's influence had lined up the usual suspects in order to stifle the book. Orwell had to take the book to 13 publishers before eventually Frederick Warburg managed to get enough paper together to publish it. To the chagrin of the literary establishment, Animal Farm proved an instant respect for success. Reputedly, Queen Elizabeth, mother of Elizabeth II, sent her footman to get a copy. It spread like wildfire across the Atlantic. 
If we leave out the gibberings of various dictators, Animal Farm became one of the best-selling books of the 20th century. Its basic message, a revolution betrayed, made and continues to make Orwell's name famous throughout the world. It also made him rich. But would he live to enjoy those riches? Certainly after 1945, as his literary success waxed, so his personal work waned. His wife, Irene O'Shaughnessy, herself the sister of a top-class surgeon, went in for what was thought to be a routine operation in a Newcastle hospital and died without coming out of the anaesthetic. But his own health was on the wane. His lungs were diseased by years of chain smoking. And in September 1946, he would take the tenancy of Barnhill Farm on the Isle of Jura. But not only his personal world, but the world at large was worsening around Orwell. His sequel to Animal Farm was 1984. And I think if we simply look at the title and the first page, we shall see its main features. In the first place, 1984 is a numerical palindrome. Yes, it does forecast what the world would be like in 1984. It picks up and projects trends Orwell had noticed and projects them up into the future. But it's also 1948 when the book was written, reverse. It's, it's, it centres the book squarely in what was happening in the contemporary world. Stalin was busy destroying democracy and annexing Eastern Europe. His thugs throwing the Czech Prime Minister out of a prison window. Mao Zedong would seize China with the same ideology. And Orwell's awful Franco was still the reign in Spain. Now, let's go to the first page. And the clocks were striking 13. The world is meant to be a utopia where the goddess of reason is supreme. But it is a dystopia, as we see from contradictory details. The hallway smelled of boiled cabbage and old rag mats. At the one end of it, a coloured poster, too late. Can you see? A coloured poster. Okay. In your picture. That's right. More than a while. Oh, gosh. Two pages. Right. At the one end of it, a coloured poster, too large for an indoor display, had been tacked to the wall. It depicted simply an enormous face, more than a metre wide. The face of a man of about 45, with a heavy black moustache and ruggedly handsome features. Winston made for the stairs. It was no use trying the lift, even at the best of times. It was seldom working, and at present the electric current was cut off during daylight hours. It, it was the eyes which are so contrived that the eyes follow you about when you move. Big Brother is watching you, the caption beneath it ran. And this is Orwell's technique. He talks about the present, but he also predicts the future. Okay? Fine. Good. We could even ask how, uh, even in a comparatively free country such as our own, his predictions are or could come true. Examples. The telescreen, CCTV, Newspeak, it's computer language or PC language, the division of the world into three great powers, Oceania with Britain as airstrip one, Eurasia and East Asia. But Orwell's abilities as a prophet are not what we set out to discuss. The subject, I hope, we have pursued is the truth and Mr. Blair, for his belief in the truth as an end in itself, as a constant and not a relative value, that George Orwell continues to send out revelations into the world. A tall radio transmitter of a man, still sending out the same message through all the phony elections, mendacious propaganda and manipulator spin that we have had to listen to in my lifetime. And if we don't stand by that truth, Orwell makes the alternative very clear. Here at the end of 1984 is the conversation between Wilson Smith and his inquisitor, O'Brien. Do you 
Remember, he, he went on, writing in an diary, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two makes four. Yes, said Winston. Brian held up his left hand, his back towards Winston, with the thumb hidden and the four fingers extended. How many fingers am I holding up, Winston? Four. And if the party says that it is not four, but five, then how many? Four. The word ended in a gasp of pain. The needle of the dial, dial had shot up to 55. The sweat had sprung out all over Winston's body. The air tore in his lungs and issued again in deep groans, which even by clenching his teeth he could not stop. O'Brien watched him, the forefinger still extended. He drew back the lever. This time, the pain was only slightly eased. How many fingers, Winston? Four. The needle went up to 60. How many fingers, Winston? Four! Four! Why else can I say? Four! The needle must have risen again, but he did not look at it. The heavy stern face and the four fingers filled his vision. The fingers stood up before his eyes like pillars, enormous, bloody, and seeming to vibrate, but unmistakably four. How many fingers, Winston? Four! Stop it! Stop it! How can you go on? Four! Four! How many fingers, Winston? Five! 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 No, Winston, that is no use. You are lying. You still think there are four. How many fingers, please? Four! Five! Four! Anything you like. Only stop it. Stop the pain. Fortunately, the pain has stopped in some regimes, only to spring eternal in others. But now tuberculosis was getting the better of Eric Arthur Blair. He left Jura for Hermeyer's Hospital in East Kilbride. He became a gaunt and lonely figure. He would propose marriage to almost any woman he met. Eventually, he met Sonia Brownell, a woman, a young woman who had circulated in the literary world, and they were married in University College Hospital, London, with the groom in a deep crimson smoking jacket, propped up in bed, with beside him his friend Malcolm Muggeridge as best man. The groom was 46, the bride 31. Eric Blair's lung hemorrhaged on the night of 21st January 1950, and he died at once and alone. He had asked to be buried, according to the rites, of the Church of England. Some years ago, I visited Orwell's grave in the Sutton Courtney churchyard in Oxfordshire. I didn't know if a prayer was appropriate, but what I did say was this. They're all gone now, Franco, Hitler and Stalin, and the orthodoxies that surrounded them, surrounded them. They didn't win, you did.